most cartoonists actually enjoy the thought that they may be upsetting the odd person through their drawings. We still see it as our mission to twist a few tails. That's T-A-I-L-S, not T-A-L-E-S. I feel sure that that is a sentiment that the editors of Dublin Opinion, Ireland's most celebrated satirical magazine, would have enthusiastically endorsed. Dublin Opinion first appeared at a most inauspicious moment in Irish history. In March 1922, in the middle of what has been termed the Cold Civil War, the hiatus between the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in the previous December and the start of the actual Civil War with the bombardment of the Four Courts at the end of June. <coughs> if, in the words of its editors, if the starting of a humorous paper with no resources beyond the enthusiasm of two inexperienced people it was a lunatic thing, surely to bring one out at such a time was matter still. Quite so. But the magazine began with an aspiration to peace and unity. Its first cover featured a cartoon of Arthur Griffith and Eamon de Valera smoking pipes of peace. The sentiment and the light tone in which it was expressed seemed to catch the public imagination. The first issue sold out. It was the start of a successful run that went on for 42 years. Dublin Opinion was published monthly, a miscellany of quips, short articles, poems, and cartoons, all in a humorous vein, but with serious intent. Its masthead initially included a subtitle in Irish that translated as seriousness in humour. And Charles E. Kelly, one of the magazine's editors, and its principal cartoonist, later remarked that from the start, mixed in with the nonsense, there were appeals in article and cartoon for peace. <coughs> the journal, without sacrificing its humour, would always retain the capacity for conveying a serious message. And the message had greater impact because it was delivered in a humorous way. More generally, it saw humor as an inherently serious matter. To quote Kelly again, true humor is not idle words, but has a useful function as a corrective of folly, pomposity, and injustice. Accordingly, the editors of Dublin Opinion would claim that humour is the safety valve of a nation, and that a nation which has its values right will always be able to laugh at itself. The two inexperienced people who established Dublin Opinion were Arthur Booth and the aforementioned Charles E. Kelly, both Dubliners and both gifted cartoonists. They were aged 30 and 19, respectively, when they embarked on their unlikely publishing venture. Booth was a clerk in the Dublin United Tramways Company, and Kelly, a junior civil servant in the Office of National Education, the precursor of the Department of Education. They had met through an amateur dramatic society in Dublin, the initiative for Dublin Opinion came from Booth, who financed the first issue with the help of a loan from a friend, and he became its first, ed its first editor. Kelly was on board from the start, and he recruited a work colleague, Tom Collins, also a Dubliner, aged 28 in 1922, as the main writer. Collins was, in Kelly's words, the office jester in the Office of National Education, with many brilliant verses on office characters to his name, and a gift for memorable 
repartee. He would now have a wider canvas. Booth and Kelly would contribute mainly cartoons, the latter signing his distinctive work, C.E.K. When Booth died prematurely of tuberculosis in 1926, Kelly and Collins became joint editor of the journal, and they continued in this partnership until 1968. Collins retired from the civil service in 1934 to work full-time on double opinion. Kelly remained a civil servant and enjoyed a conspicuously successful career, becoming director of broadcasting for Radio Erin, then part of the Department of Post and Telegraphs, from 1948 to 1952, and later director of savings in charge of the Post Office Savings Bank. It was certainly unusual for a serving civil servant and a senior one to boot to be so openly associated with a publication like Dublin Opinion. Kelly's dual roles did sometimes give rise to adverse comment, if not controversy. One such occasion was in 1948. Fianna Fáil had been defeated in the general election in February of that year and they took exception to the July issue of Dublin Opinion. It was admittedly favourable towards the new government, and one cartoon, this one, conveyed the hope that the government's initial good fortune would continue. It showed the ministers all superstitiously touching the cabinet table with the, cap with the caption, the government Feeling that things are going with an almost alarming smoothness, smoothness touches wood. <laughs> the matter was raised in the Doyle by two former Finnefoil ministers, Sean McEntee and PJ Little. And Little had been Minister for Post and Telegraphs in the outgoing government, and therefore Kelly's political boss. While McEntee described Dublin opinion, as a certain party political journal published monthly in this country, which has been consistently anti fiddiform uh, little complained that a permanent official is running a monthly magazine which has taken sides in politics with considerable emphasis. He continued, there were times when I was in office when that complaint was made, and by disciplinary action we tried to it. But I feel now the Minister will have to take very grave notice of the completely partisan attitude taken up in that paper. The Minister, James Everett, defended Kelly and his career was not adversely affected. More usually, however, Irish politicians were as amused as everyone else by the fair offer double opinion, and most recognised its value in reducing the deep-seated tensions in Irish public life in the aftermath of the Civil War. Sean T. O'Kelly, second president of Ireland, once praised it for pouring month after month the balm of laughter on our wounds, and he added that none of us can afford to forget the healing power after. There were many jocund references to Dublin opinion in the Doyle debates, further testimony to its acceptance by the political establishment. Dublin opinion's ability to avoid annoying politicians too much was the result of what Kelly himself called its policy of giving only kindly criticism which meant, and I quote, that we made no enemies and our victims became our friends. He, he's noted that our general policy was that where we did criticize, we should do so without inflicting pain, and that the successful critical cartoon or article was one that made the victim, if there was one, laugh. 
Nevertheless, Dublin Opinion was one of the most political, funny papers in existence. That's the verdict of Vivian Mercer in a short study of the journal published in the Bell in 1944. Its political bias has been aptly described as generally on the side of the people and following, and following our national propensity for being humorously again the government, whatever government may be in power. It claimed not to have any politics, by which it meant no party politics, and it never, for example, endorsed or opposed any party or candidate at election time. Its political manifesto, set out in an early issue, makes it abundantly clear where it stood and what its priorities were. I quote, Our politics, we have none. It is our duty to support the free state because it is here, for good or ill, by the wish of the people. Against the principle of the Republicans, there is nothing to be said. Principle is written in letters of gold, proof against the assets of logic and sophistry. Dublin Opinion's support for the Irish Free State lends some credence to McEntee's claim that it was less than sympathetic towards the reform. It, it recognised, of course, that the Free State, as established under the 1921 Treaty, fell short of the Republican ideal. When the shade of Robert Emmett is asked for his epitaph, his epitaph in the journal's inaugural issue, his response is, not yet. But its view was that since the majority of the Irish people had accepted the Free State, the politicians should now get on with the job of government in a spirit of cooperation in the best interests of the people. The pursuit of greater independence could wait for another day. Its first issue, as we have seen, called for the pro and anti treaty factions to pull together. And this was a recurring theme in the pages of the journal. For instance, in October 1927, soon after Fianna Fáil entered the door, a cover cartoon depicted W.T. Cosgrave and Ava de Valera on either side of the dotted line, and the caption is, to bring the two leaders together, fold along the dotted line. <laughs> 30 years later, in the course of the 1957 general election campaign, it published a cartoon showing the ghost of the Civil War saying to an usher outside the Doyle chamber, get me out of here while they're all away. I'm tired haunting this place. During the Second World War, Dublin Opinion twice called for the formation of a national government, and it did so again in 1956. It held de Valera largely responsible for the persistence of civil war divisions and viewed what it perceived as his autocratic tendencies and inability to compromise as the main obstacle to cooperation between all the parties. Thus, when de Valera was about to be elected president and so removed from active politics, it announced that there are hopes that the civil war in Ireland will end around June 1959, the month of the election. Accordingly, it would be fairer to say that Dublin opinion was anti de Valera rather than anti Fianna Fáil. This focus on de Valera should be seen as a function, perhaps more accurately the flip side, of the cult of de Valera that he and his followers fostered from the very first moment he emerged into the political arena after the 1916 Rising. As Anne Dolan has pointed out in her study of Dublin Opinion in the period of the Civil War, for Dublin Opinion, 
De Valera embodied the anti-treaty side, even when it was obvious that the real thrust of Republican power emanated from the O'Connors and the Lynches and the Aikens. She adds that Dublin opinion consciously chose the anti-treaty's political face, and that helped create the erroneous impression that de Valera was literally calling the shots during the Civil War. On the cover of its March 1925 issue, it published what was probably its toughest anti-de Valera cartoon ever, a full-length portrait of de Valera, so tall that his head pushes the top border of the cartoon upwards and distorts the text above it with the caption, High Treason. And later, in the 1950s, it was exasperated by the determination of de Valera and Fianna Fáil to hold on to power. Thus, the cover of its Christmas issue in 1958 showed de Valera as the proprietor of a hostelry named the I Stay In. <laughs> and this exasperation fueled its campaign against Fiddleford's proposal to abolish the proportional representation voting system in 1959. More generally, Dublin opinion scorned de Valera's professed belief that he had a unique insight into what the people of Ireland wanted. The February 1944 cover has the female figure of Ireland, Jane Era, watching wistfully as de Valera rides off on a horse, supposedly after a romantic assassination with her, and musing, I'm sure I do love him, but at times I wish he'd stop looking into his own heart to find out what I want. <laughs> in the same vein, when de Valera was preparing his new constitution in the 1930s, a sharp Dublin opinion cartoon showed him addressing a convention of the Fianna Fáil party. He asks whether he should now read the new constitution to the assembly, and the unanimous reply is, no, whatever it is, we prove it. In its treatment of de Valera's constitution, the journal reflected the widespread criticism of the position of women that it posited, specifically the emphasis on a woman's life within the home. Thus, the cover of the June 1937 issue depicted de Valera asleep in bed and dreaming of being attacked by the iconic figures of Queen Maeve Grand Whale carrying a long spear and a heavy sword, respectively. The caption is entitled A Dream of Fair Women, and the caption reads Say, big boy, about those articles in the Constitution. But De Valera's most amusing and ironic comment on the new Constitution was in a cover cartoon published in its April 1937 issue, when the drafting process was almost complete. The ghost of Robert Emmett visits de Valera, inquiring whether his epitaph might now be written, and he is told to call back later. <laughs> the unfinished business of writing Emmett's epitaph would feature again in Dublin Opinion, when Ireland was formally declared a republic in 1949. A cartoon in the December 1948 issue showed Hemet's ghost anticipating the declaration and saying to the Taoiseach, John A. Costello, one more step, Mr. Costello, and then let my epitaph be written. Clearly, Dublin opinion rejoiced that the republican ideal against which it had previously declared there was nothing to be said, was about to be realized, and by peaceful means. It was justification 
of its editorial stance since 1922. De Valera's new constitution retained proportional representation, PR, as Ireland's electoral system. With Fianna defeat in two general elections, in 1948 and in 1954, caused de Valera to have second thoughts. Soon after Fianna Fáil returned to power in 1951, a Dublin Opinion cartoon showed a small figure representing PR hiding behind a pillar <coughs> with de Valera lurking in the background. And PR says, I don't think he really likes me. <laughs> By 1959, de Valera had resolved to replace PR with the straight vote system. In other words, the Westminster model. Dublin opinion stoutly defended PR in two remarkable cartoons. The first, capitalizing on de Valera's reputation as a mathematics genius, had him standing at Broom Bridge in Dublin, famously associated with Rowan Hamilton's discovery <coughs> of the formula for quaternion multiplication and choking up on the side of the bridge the formula FF minus PR <laughs> equals FF to the power of N. <laughs> the other cartoon set out the issue at stake with devastating clarity. It featured a schoolroom with three boys of differing height standing at a blackboard on which their teacher had drawn three apples. And the teacher explains, under PR, each boy gets an apple. Under the straight vote, the biggest boy gets the lot. The referendum necessary to effect the proposed change was lost by a narrow margin, less than 4%. And Dublin Opinion's campaign was widely credited with having had a huge influence on the outcome. It celebrated with the quip, a straight vote has retained PR. Arguably, this was its finest hour. It similarly opposed a similar, a, a second attempt by De Valera, by Fianna Fáil, to abolish PR in 1968. It criticized the repeat referendum as the never ending. But by then, Dublin opinion was in decline, and the part it played in the very heavy defeat that Fianna Fáil suffered was less critical than in 1959. There was one other occasion when Dublin opinion was felt to have influenced the result of the poll, and that poll was, ironically given its dislike of de Valera, the 1932 general election that brought Fianna Fáil into power for the first time. Despite having supported the Free State against its Republican opponents in its early years, Dublin opinion had grown weary of the common denial government. A factor in this was undoubtedly its default position of opposition to the government, irrespective of its hue. But it had strongly attacked the Public Safety Acts of 1927 and 28 especially the provision in them to suppress periodicals, and it abhorred the harsh budgetary strategy pursued by Ernest Blythe as Minister for Finance. Cartoons about the budget were an annual occurrence in the life of Dublin opinion, but they were never quite as sharp as in Blythe's period in office. The best of them from this period was one showing a group of citizens being squeezed by the burden of taxation in an enormous screw press with the caption, a nation wins again, <laughs> parodying the refrain of the well-known patriotic song. Its treatment of Blythe undoubtedly helped demonize him in the eyes of the public and his reputation never recovered. Blythe was one of a number of Irish politicians 
singled out dubious honor of being, for the moment, the favorite butt of Dublin opinion's humor. De Valera was always in their sights, but others would come into focus for a period and would receive sustained attention. Perhaps the most prominent was Sean T. O'Kelly, whose praise of Dublin opinion, notwithstanding its treatment of him, I have already noted. A diminutive man, he was De Valera's long-time deputy before becoming President of Ireland. And in Dublin opinion cartoons, he was often juxtaposed against the much taller figure of his leader. A cartoon of the pair of them after Fianna Fáil came to power in 1932 is entitled The Long and the Short of the Law. <laughs> the long-serving Lord Mayor of Dublin, Alfie Byrne, was another uh, particular target. Famous for shaking the hand of everybody he met, he was invariably depicted with an outstretched hand. <laughs> And Dublin opinion also had great fun at the expense of the likes of James Dillon, John A. Costello, Frank Aiken, and Tim Healy, the first Governor General of the Irish Free State. For example, in a story published in March 1923, the journal imagined Healy being visited by Parnell's ghost, who, in reference to Healy's appointment as Governor General, says to his erstwhile nemesis, you surely don't take this thing seriously. Why, I understood from what I heard that your appointment was more or less of a joke. And he replies, not at all. It's perfectly serious. 10,000 pounds a year, just imagine. 10,000 pounds is a lot of money then. <laughs> Nostalgia. Perhaps for a way of life that never really was, was always a strong theme in what Dublin opinion placed before its readers. The current crop of politicians was compared with past heroes and found wanting. Moreover, in addition to the political cartoons, most issues of the journal included at least one formal drawing that evoked an idyllic past. W. St. John Glenn contributed over many decades a series of skillful drawings of a vanishing rural life in Ballyscunion, drawings aptly characterized by C. E. Kelly as a folk museum of the life in that mythical but typical village. Here's an example entitled Rock and Roll in Ballyscunion. <laughs> These rural themes were complemented by W. H. Kong's sensitive drawings of the ghosts of George and Dublin, often placing them in buildings that had fallen into decline and were now slum dwellings, as in this image. Some people might and did dismiss the work of both men as sentimental. But their drawings could prompt a wry smile, and so they earned their place in Dublin opinion. These drawings cannot be regarded as social commentary, nor were they intended as such, which highlights a shortcoming in Dublin opinion's record, that, uh, is namely that it concentrated on the political to the detriment of the social and economic. Some of the early covers drawn by Arthur Booth did refer to social and economic matters. For example, the February 1923 cover was an image of the four horsemen of the apocalypse identified as civil war, profiteers, taxation, and unemployment. However, after Booth died in 1926, that focus largely disappeared, reflecting the fact that the journal was essentially a middle class <coughs> and therefore not in the business of challenging the underpinnings of society. 
In his study of Dublin opinion in the Bell in 1944, Vivian Mercer posed this question. For whom are all these stories of wit outpoured? And he answered as follows. The answer is, reader, for you and me, the new and rapidly growing middle class of Ireland. We want no interference from the civil service or anybody else in our self-appointed task of making money and rising in the world. We want the freedom from war, civil and foreign, that Dublin opinion has always advocated. We want to enjoy the peace and prosperity which are the be-all and the end-all of a growing middle class." Unquote. It was thus acceptable for Dublin opinion to gently lampoon politicians and their follies and failures, but more contentious issues were better avoided. The no-go areas included sex, religion and the churches, and the law. This editorial approach occasionally gave rise to adverse comment. For example, Brian O'Nolan, Miles the Gotteline, wrote in his short-lived humorous journal, Laver, that Dublin opinion lacked, and I quote, the rapier thrusts of the cold steel of criticism. But Kelly later defended himself against such charges by pointing out that Whatever way we ran the magazine, it lasted under our editorship for 42 years. Miles magazine survived for five monthly issues only. The civil service, its culture and influence, for good and ill, loomed large in Dublin opinion. Hardly surprising, since both Kelly and his fellow editor, Tom Collins, were or had been civil servants. Mercer wrote that no comic paper in any country has made its readers so bureaucrat conscious, though civil servants are fair, fair game anywhere. He suggested that the journal was written of civil servants, by civil servants, for civil servants. But it was also a perceptive and quite damning critic of the institution. On the positive side, Kelly drew two series of wonderfully whimsical cartoons about the civil service. One series depicted individual departments and offices, imputing to each a host of imagined absurdities. For example, this cartoon about the Department of Finance spread over two pages. It's not easy to see all the details. But here are two items from the cartoon up close. The first shows an official confiscating, for the common good of course, some children's savings. While the second features the drain for putting people's money down. <laughs> the other series of cartoons illustrate did certain stock phrases that civil servants use in correspondence. One of these cartoons, entitled The Department Regrets, shows an office full of middle-aged men weeping copiously. In contradistinction to such benign representations, Dublin Opinion regularly published cartoons that portrayed the civil service as bloated and a burden on the taxpayer, ineffectual and unresponsive to the needs of the people. Typical is one from 1947, in which the figure of democracy is seen carrying another figure identified as the old man of bureaucracy. And likewise, in a cartoon published shortly after the 1957 general election, when the outgoing inter-party government headed by John A. Costello was defeated, two civil servants are deep in conversation, and one says to the other, change of government? What change of government? With a permanent civil service, 
there is no change of government. And in its early years, Dublin opinion got worked up about what it claimed was a disproportionate number of cork men in the civil service. <laughs> and this gave rise to the well-known CEK cartoon, The Night the Treaty Was Signed, which pictures a mad rush of people from Cork to, to uh, Dublin to secure jobs in the new state's civil service. <laughs> a skeleton even climbs out from under his gravestone to join the scramble. <laughs> Ironically, it was the much derided civil service that initiated the process of modernizing the Irish economy with the publication in 1958 of the so-called Great Book, Economic Development, prepared by and published under the name of T.K. Whittaker, then Secretary of the Department of Finance. Whittaker is on record as saying that he was impelled to undertake this project by the cover of the September 1957 issue of Dublin Opinion, in which the young female figure of Ireland instructs a fortune teller, peering into a crystal ball, get to work, they're saying, I have no future. This shows two things. One, that civil servants did indeed read in Dublin Opinion, and two, that on some occasions at least, some people picked up the signals emitted by the journal. Messages of serious import delivered in humor and acted upon them. Later, when Whittaker arranged the historic meeting between Sean and Mass and Terence O'Neill at Stormont in 1965, Dublin Opinion welcomed it by publishing a border ballad that included an elaborate pun based on the familiar form of Whittaker's name. The mass says to O'Neill, affecting the Northern accent, which I can't do, Och Terence, I ken ye ken Whittaker, ken. <laughs> Dublin opinion generally paid little attention to the question of partition. A notable exception being in 1949, when, in response to Costello's declaration of the Republic, the Westminster Parliament passed the Ireland Act to reaffirm Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom. Lord Brookborough, the Northern Ireland Premier, was the subject on that occasion of a cover cartoon that represented him as a babysitter, minding an offspring of John Bull and Britannia, the baby is partition. Brookborough requested and was given the original drawing <coughs> of this cartoon. Ignoring Nor in Northern Ireland was consistent with normal practice in Dublin opinion. It also largely ignored the rest of the country outside Dublin and with rare exceptions, the rest of the world too. As Anne Dolan has observed, its point of view was a particularly urban Dublin point of view. Unlike the leader, it did not champion some type of rural counterculture. It was proud of where it came from, a pride which its title obviously professed. Reflecting its strong Dublin bias, Dublin opinion was hostile to farmers. According to Vivian Mercer, it's public enemy number one. In Mercer's words, Dublin Opinion's middle class readers have left the farm behind and can afford to laugh at it. In the journal's pages, farmers are seen endlessly filling out forms for grants from the government, duping government inspectors, joining myriad associations to protect their interests, smuggling cattle across the border with Northern Ireland, and constantly complaining. For example, about the lack of rain in a cartoon depicting a mythical spring show held in the Royal Dublin Society grounds on the Monday before Noah's flood. 
<laughs> when the general election was called in 1957, it published a cartoon that featured a disgruntled farmer casting an eye over his impoverished land and declaring, I vote for nobody. I've lived under God knows how many different ministers for agriculture and look at my farm. That neatly captures Dublin opinion's disdain for what it considered the Irish farmer's lack of enterprise and his sense of entitlement to assistance from the government. Assistance funded by the predominantly urban taxpayer. Its finest contribution on the theme of urban versus rural Ireland was a cartoon published in 1953 showing farmers preparing for the siege, digging trenches, erecting barricades, removing pipes from thatched roofs. And the title of the cartoon is Some Jackine Up in Dublin Starts a Rumor That Farmers Are Going to Have to Pay Income Tax on Their Incomes. <laughs> it is a classic example of Kelly's work, an expression of his Dublin mentality. Louis MacLeese, in his poem Dublin, speaks of the steel behind the laugh. And that is an apt description of the kind of humour that is most characteristic of native Dubliners. It is evident everywhere in the pages of Dublin Opinion. And in this respect, Dublin Opinion certainly does justice to its title. It also fits comfortably into what Vivian Mercer called the Irish comic tradition, which he argues is the central tradition of Irish and Anglo-Irish literature and can be traced back to oral Gaelic roots in the ninth century. Mercer identifies the elements of this tradition as a bent for wild humor, a delight in witty wordplay, and a tendency to regard satire as one of the indispensable functions of the literary man. Its limitation is playing with words rather than ideas. <clears throat> Kelly acknowledged Dublin Opinion's place in that tradition when he wrote in 1970, after Collins and himself had disposed of the journal, we kept up an output of on-the-spot humorous comment that would not have shamed our foremost nat national wits from wild to Gogarty. He didn't mention Shaw, but he could have. <laughs> the journal claimed affinity with Swift on the bicentenary of his death in 1945 by publishing a cartoon portrait with this statement attributed to him. Mind you, if I were alive today, I'd have a few things to say too. <laughs> in the 1960s, the circulation of Dublin Opinion, which had remained constant at over 40,000 per issue since 1925, began to decline. The politicians, whom it had learned to the lampoon so brilliantly, were growing old and passing from the scene. And it simply did not have the measure of the next generation, then emerging. <laughs> Moreover, its humour now seemed very timid compared to the vicious satire in, for example, the British magazine Private Eye and the BBC television programme That Was the Week That Was. Their sides against the great and the good could be both personal and offensive, in contrast to the gentle humour of Dublin opinion. Kelly and Collins sold up in 1968, though the journal struggled on under new ownership for a brief period afterwards, a pale shadow of its former self. What had been its influence? Kelly himself thought that it had done a little to heal the national wound of the Civil War. It probably saved proportional representation in 1959 and it inspired T.K. Whittaker to write his seminal great book. These were considerable achievements. But Dublin opinion also made us laugh, an achievement in itself, and we were all the better for that. 
to paraphrase Dr. Johnson, it added to the gaiety of the nation and to the public stock of harmless pleasure. Thank you.